Hello and welcome to Mellow Labs. On today's episode, I turn this cheap Bluetooth multimeter into a Wi-Fi multimeter. And along the way, I learn how to use a logic analyzer, decode serial protocols, and power an ESP32 with just two AA batteries. And all so that I can have a web page that shows me all of my multimeter readings, because why not? So let's start from the beginning. All of this started with my friend Pyro sending me an AliExpress listing for this multimeter and I was intrigued, it was around £20, the reviews seemed pretty favourable and I've been looking for a way to make my multimeter readings more visually interesting for my videos and live streams, so I thought, why not, let's order it. About a week later my new Bluetooth multimeter arrived so I started off by putting in some new batteries and running some very basic tests alongside my previous multimeter. They seem to perform pretty much identically to my untrained eye, not enough zeros to impress Marco reps, but good enough for me. Then I decided to play around with the Bluetooth functionality, so I downloaded the vendors app onto my phone, turned on the Bluetooth mode on the multimeter, and the two connected pretty much instantaneously, which like never happens when it comes to Bluetooth devices, so kudos for making that happen. And I basically just played around with it by varying the voltage on my bench power supply into the multimeter and saw that the numbers changed on the multimeter and on my app, so basically works as advertised. Next, I wanted to have a look at what's inside, so I removed every screw I could see, but I couldn't get the two halves of the body to come apart. Eventually I did, using a prying tool, but then I learned that I could have just pushed on the battery enclosure, which made the whole thing come apart, so a good thing to remember in case you want to take yours apart. Once inside, I had a long look at the PCB, and besides all the usual discrete components, the main MCU was a blob chip, and the only other thing of interest on here was the Bluetooth module, which was marked as an F-9788, which I don't have a lot of experience with Bluetooth modules, but this looks like an off-the-shelf component. At this point I decided to fully remove the PCB to have a look at the front of it and I didn't find anything particularly interesting. Overall the PCB did look good, but you know what would make it look even better? If it was made by today's sponsor. Today's guided meditation is brought to you by JLC PCB. Let's begin with a deep breath in and exhale through your mouth. Now close your eyes and envision your project. You started with a seedling of an idea and it grew into a beautiful disaster on a breadboard. And as beautiful as it is, you know that it really wants to blossom. And the only way for it to do that is for it to become a PCB. JLC PCB provides easy, affordable and reliable PCB services empowering you to manifest your electrical dreams into reality. The process couldn't be easier. Just upload your Gerber files to jlcpcb.com and an instant quote will appear in front of you, like clarity from a dense fog. Ordering takes mere minutes and it's as easy as online shopping, yet as profound as creation itself. Find peace in knowing that affordable and quality PCBs start from just $2 for one to eight layer PCBs, thanks to their massive in-house efficient production, bringing down the savings to you, helping you to let go of your financial anxieties. Picture your design starting its journey in one of their state-of-the-art factories where quality control guides every step. What takes consciousness years to achieve, JLC manifests in just 24 hours. Lightning fast PCB production using only premium chakra aligned materials. And now special enlightenment awaits. JLC PCB is offering $30 off their top quality six layer PCBs for just $5 with an ENGI finish and no engineering fees for VRIN pad 
and new seekers get $60 in coupons with the link in my description. Thank you to JLC PCB for sponsoring today's guided meditation and now gently open your eyes and look upon your breadboard and feel inspired to convert it to a PCB with JLC PCB. After I reassembled it, I wanted to learn more about how it actually worked. So I went digging online and I found an absolute gold mine in the form of a GitHub repository detailing everything there is to know about this multimeter and its close relatives. Everything from the bill of materials, the screen layout and some notes on the communication protocol. I'll leave all those links down in the description in case you're interested. I also discovered a couple community-based desktop applications that utilize the Bluetooth features and they look very good, they have graphs, they have all the readings, pretty much everything I need. But this got me thinking, I don't really want to have to start an application whenever I want to record things or show people things on the stream. I'd really like this to be an automatic thing that happens when I turn on the Bluetooth functionality. So this got me thinking, what if I replace the Bluetooth module with an ESP32 hosting a web page that will just pop up whenever I turn on the Bluetooth functionality? Could this be done? I grabbed the GitHub repository for one of the desktop applications and then I stripped it down with the help of GPT to just its bare essentials, just connect to the multimeter and display the readings in the terminal. I had to hard code my MAC address into the script so that it only connects to my multimeter and I got the MAC address from the full version of the app. When you try to connect, it just displays it. So you can just grab it from there and put it into your script. And then I had a fully functioning script that just connected to my multimeter and showed me my readings with nothing else. So I thought if I can strip this down this far, I can definitely get this to run on an ESP32 and host a web server. So in that case, I needed to figure out how the multimeter talks to the Bluetooth module. So I looked online and I found a data sheet for the Bluetooth module that included a pinout. And some of the pins were pretty self-explanatory like RX and TX, but the other pins, I had no idea if they were connected or even doing anything. So to figure that out, I made a spreadsheet with all of the GPIOs listed and the different states that the multimeter can be in, like off, on, Bluetooth on, Bluetooth connecting and Bluetooth connected. From there, I started measuring the voltages on each of the GPIO pins during the different states and that revealed something interesting. GPIO 5 was most likely the multimeter telling the Bluetooth module to start pairing, which also made the little Bluetooth logo on the multimeter start blinking. And when the Bluetooth finally connected, the whole thing lit up like a Christmas tree. But I still had no way of knowing what each of the GPIO pins were actually doing. Were they inputs or were they outputs? So I decided to solder on an ESP32 to the RX and TX pins, but I knew so little about what I was doing at this point that I basically just input a bunch of different baud rates to see if I could get something. And when nothing happened, I gave up. So I decided to do what any good electrical engineer would do in my predicament, throw money at the problem. I've been meaning to get a logic analyzer for a long time now, ever since my ESP32 instant camera project went a little off the rails and I had to get four different thermal printers, but I kept putting it off thinking I wasn't smart enough. So I went onto AliExpress and I bought one for just four pounds. And spoiler alert, it solved all of my problems. Whilst I was waiting for the logic analyzer to arrive, I actually fully fleshed out the look of the web page that was going to be displaying my readings. And I actually did this using Claude AI. I actually find the websites that come out of Claude AI with very little prompting to look pretty much exactly like what I want. I'm sure it's just a, uh, a prompt thing, but I just prefer it over what I get from GPT. When the logic analyzer finally arrived, I followed this tutorial to set it up with PulseView and then I watched a video about how to actually use PulseView and that gave me enough information to get started. Then I connected channels to each of the GPI opens that I know were doing something and I set PulseView to 5 million samples at 50 kilohertz with a UART decoder on the RX and TX and hit record and went through the process of turning on the multimeter, enabling Bluetooth, connecting to Bluetooth and receiving data. And that capture told me pretty much everything I needed to know. The TX pin is always high, it never actually transmits anything. We already know that GPIO5 tells the Bluetooth module to go into pairing mode. And now I learned that GPIO6 is what actually tells the multimeter 
that a Bluetooth connection has been established and it can start sending data. So at this point, I had a theory. What happens if I turn on the Bluetooth module, but don't actually connect it to anything and then manually pull pin six high? Would the multimeter start sending data even though the Bluetooth module isn't actually connected? And yes, it absolutely does. And when I saw that this worked, I immediately had to make a Melo's Chaotic Update, which is a short update series that I do on Patreon whenever something so cool happens that I just have to tell people about it. So if you're interested in that, consider supporting me over on Patreon and get your name on my plaque board. So with all of that figured out, the last piece of the puzzle was the data itself. So I updated my desktop script to print out the raw data coming in over Bluetooth, which was packets of 11 bytes, which I then compared to the packets I had coming in over the logic analyzer, but the two weren't the same. So I was a little confused. I've shorted the two terminals on my multimeter so that the data I was getting back to back from the logic analyzer and over Bluetooth were exactly the same, but the two weren't the same. So I did the only thing I could think of. I asked GPT when gave it the readings and it pointed out that there was some kind of obfuscation happening going from the multimeter to the Bluetooth module and over Bluetooth. So from my two readings, it was able to figure out the vendor key, which I then got it to just apply to the script. So now I had a script that printed out both the raw data coming in over Bluetooth and what it should be in my logic analyzer. And with those two being a match, I was very excited and I did a little jig because I was most of the way there with this project. At this point, I was fully done with the logic analyzer. So I desoldered it from my multimeter and I soldered back on my ESP32. And the only two pins I actually had to solder on was ground and the read pin. From there, I updated the script for the ESP32 to actually print out the raw data coming in from the multimeter. And when that worked, I was so excited. I didn't just do a little jig. I had full on zoomies. The next thing I did was update the script so that I actually had human readable multimeter readings in the serial monitor. And when that worked, I basically just gave GPT the full on go ahead in make the web server along with the uh, HTML I had made for the web page. And it did, it made the full web page. I loaded it up, it booted up the web page and I had readings and it was beautiful. From there, the last thing to figure out was how I was actually going to power the ESP32 with the multimeter so that it turns on and off properly when I need it to. My first instinct was to power the ESP32 directly off of the batteries on the multimeter, but with the maximum being just three volts, it wasn't actually enough to get the ESP started. So then I grabbed a boost converter that converted the 2.6 volts at the time to five volts, which did get it started, but then I had the problem of not actually being able to turn it off. So then it would just constantly be draining the batteries. So then I thought, what if I use a MOSFET between the battery and the boost converter with the gate pin connected to GPIO5 so that I can actually turn it on and off with enabling and disabling the Bluetooth function. And that probably would have worked if it wasn't for the MOSFETs I had available. They were the 2N7000s, which only have a max rating of 200 milliamps, which was not enough to actually power the boost converter and then the ESP. So I had to go searching online for a better solution. Pretty quickly, I came across the TPS61023, which is a boost converter module that can bring two volts up to five volts at one amp, and it has an enable pin that I can use to actually turn it on and off. I found it on AliExpress for about seven pounds, so before I bought it, I looked at the data sheet and it seemed like exactly what I needed. So I bought it and then I waited. When it eventually arrived, I decided to run some tests just to make sure that it works the way it says it should. So I put two volts on the input pin and I put my multimeter on the five volt output. And when I pulled the enable pin high, I got five volts on the multimeter. And when I pulled it low, I got zero. And then I put it on a breadboard so that I can wire it into the multimeter and the ESP32. And when I turned on the Bluetooth mode, it then turned on the boost converter, which then powered on the ESP32, which then launched the site and showed me readings. At this point, it was time to basically finish the project. So I started off by doing some cleanup. I desoldered all the wires that I was using previously. I removed the Bluetooth module since it was no longer needed. 
I then put the ESP32 and the boost module onto a prototype PCB board so that I can properly wire it into the multimeter and then I actually found a good spot in the enclosure to hold the ESP32 and the boost module without it interacting with any of the other components and it was in a convenient enough place for me to drill a hole so that I can have future access for the USB-C port in case I ever need to update the Wi-Fi credentials or the script for whatever reason, it's better to have it than to not. And then shockingly with all of the wires and everything, the enclosure properly closed without any issue. So then I put all the screws back into the multimeter and it was finished. It's a little bit weird to think that a few days ago I thought I was too stupid to use a logic analyzer and I'm now holding a multimeter that runs its own web server. So if there's something that you've been putting off because you thought it was out of reach, give it a go. I'm sure you can figure it out. Now let's give this guy a little bit of a demo. I collected a couple of components that I can play around with. So let's turn it on. I'm going to put it into ohms mode and turn on the Bluetooth and it should just boot up the web server and connect. It's already done. I was expecting that to take longer. Awesome. So we are in ohms mode. Now let's measure this resistor. And that is a 5.4, 5.4K. And this resistor is a 2K. Fantastic. I just realized I don't actually have K or M on the uh, ohms measurement. So I should probably update that. Now let's put it into diode mode and test this LED. So we've got blue 2.5, green 2.2 and red at 1.8. Awesome. And the last thing I wanna play around with is temperature. So I've got one of these uh, multimeter temperature probes, which in honesty, I don't use very often. So let's put this into temperature like that. Temperature Celsius. It is now 19 degrees, 17, 13. Okay, a little bit jumpy, cool. So about 18 degrees, and if I put it into my mouth, it's about 32 degrees. Oh, I also don't have the C rating on the, on the web page thing. So I need to update that too, but it works. That's really good. If you wanna make one of these yourself, I'll leave all of the links to everything I used in the description below, as well as the actual code that I use for this. So with that, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Support me on Patreon if you can, and I'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye.